quickly i'll get get started i'll give you a quick rundown of uh, what this domain is all about so to look at it it risk identification this is the first domain this got around 27 percentage of the questions okay nishaka has given clear blueprints on how many questions you can expect from each of those domains right this has got 27 questions approximately 41 questions but trust me when you take up the uh, exam you will not be interested to you know identify or you will not be able you will not be interested to you know categorize and then see if this blueprint was actually followed correct right? because you will more be interested to answer that question in the right way correct right? so uh, this is just for information right this just shows you uh, shows you the kind of importance that you will need to give to each of those domains so 27 and 28 one and two is of prime importance then you have your it risk response which is your third domain 23 percent and then your risk monitoring and feedback that is your last domain which is of 22 percent okay so what are we going to take away from uh, risk identification we are going to identify standards frameworks and practices for your risk identification then we are going to see some techniques of risk identification we are going to see and how we can apply those techniques distinguish between threats and vulnerabilities identify relevant stakeholders this is very important there is something called as a resi matrix so we will talk about a resi matrix we will talk about you know organization hierarchy and everything we will talk about risk scenarios so identification uh, will never be completed without risk scenarios we will talk about how risk scenarios can be developed to identify specific gaps within the business process or an IT process or a control to un understand more about those risks. And there is a bottom up uh, approach, there is a top down uh, approach that is in place. So we'll be discussing them as well. Okay. We'll talk about uh, risk appetite, risk tolerance again, uh, which we discussed. So I think when we get there, it will be a little easy because we've got a great deal of uh, discussion today. We've done a good uh, decent amount of time today. So when we get to those slides, it will be really helpful for us. And describe the key elements of the risk register. As I was saying, risk register is one holistic place where you have all the risk documented for your organization. Uh, so we will have to have what are those individual columns uh, that are required for every uh, risk in the risk register? Uh, how, how should it be documented? Uh, what are all the key attributes that needs to go in to a risk register? All those things will need to be will be discussing. And then you will have the last point on awareness programs. So which is uh, very, very basic, right? You will need to understand how different business units will have to have tailor made awareness program text. Like you can't have one common risk awareness program for entire organization. Or let's say, for example, for IT services, uh, for IT team, we'll have a different set of uh, security awareness deck. Whereas for your legal teams, for your sales teams, for your HR teams, you'll have a different security awareness decks because the kind of the exposure of exposure that they get for your systems will differ, right? HR system, HR people will have a different set of exposure to HR systems, whereas IT guys will have a greater deal of uh, exposure. So, uh, so it has to be more technical for the IT team and has to be less technical for the other teams because they are not very technical people, right? So your risk awareness program should include and should take into consideration while designing all of that. Okay. So in ISACA, unlike any other ISACA exam, even for serious, we have something called as task statements and knowledge statement. So what is a task statement? What is the knowledge statement? Task statements are something what is what as a risk practitioner are you expected to accomplish? That is your task statement. You are given a task. Okay, how will you do that? That is your task statement. What is a knowledge statement? What are all the skills and uh, the education that you need to possess in order to do a particular task statement? So task statements and knowledge statements are mapped, correct? Right? But for the exam, you don't have to remember any of these. This is just to structure the way in which the content is written from ISACA. This is just for you to holistically approach the exam course where, okay, exam course or uh, the content that is there. But nowhere in the ISACA exam, they're going to ask you, what, tell me which of the following below is T1.2 or T1.3. No, such questions will never appear in the exam, right? This is just for us to understand what are the different responsibilities that I'm supposed to do and what are the different uh, knowledge that I need to acquire in order to deliver these task statements, correct? Uh, collect review information, including existing documentation regarding the internal external business. I'm just reading it out. So to identify potential impacts of IT risk to organization business objectives and operations. So this is basically to understand 1.1 is on how do you collect uh, specific uh, artifacts to in order to identify specific risks. What are the different uh, resources that you will that you can use to collect that uh, risk information that your organization is exposed to them. Right? That is your first uh, task statement. One or two talks about identifying potential threats, vulnerabilities. So, so you will also talk about what are the different threats and vulnerabilities that are there uh, for the organization. Right? 
and technology to enable IT this kind of. So your next phase in the life cycle is first phase is your identification phase, and then the uh, next phase is called your risk assessment phase or analysis phase, where you will say how many are high, medium, and low. Correct. Right? So this these threats and vulnerabilities which you identify in this phase will basically help you to articulate your risk impact values in the subsequent phases. Correct. Right? Develop a comprehensive set of IT risk scenarios. So 1.3 talks about risk scenarios. As I said earlier, risk scenarios are uh, as a type of technique which you can use to understand from you know, subject matter experts, database admins, uh, storage admins, backup admins. You talk to these people to understand specific risks that are there for each of their areas. So you give them like you know, specific components. What if this goes down? What if this get, gets corrupted? What if somebody misuses a password? You give specific scenarios. So how do you develop such scenarios? That is task one dot three, right? And that is the best way of identifying risks. And then one dot four talks about key stakeholders uh, for IT risk scenarios to help establish accountability. Very 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 important. One dot four. You say you identify a risk. You will have to clearly you know uh, tag a particular person from that team or uh, from the management of the team to say he, this guy is a risk owner. This guy is accountable for fixing or treating this risk in the agreed uh, risk treatment plan, right? So all those things are your task statements, which we'll be discussing in the uh, entire domain. And then 1.5 talks about IT risk register, uh, ensure that IT risks are captured. And that's whenever you have those scenarios discussed, you will basically have outcomes. Outcomes is, okay, out of these scenarios that we discussed, these were the four or five risks that are there, and this is the outcome. So I'm going to tabulate those uh, four or five risks in the enterprise risk register, okay? This, this is mostly, this will be a tool, uh, like for example, it could be a service now, it could be an archer, it could be any of those tools, it could even be a, a simple Excel sheet in some organization. I've seen in an immature organization, they will have something like a very simple, uh, you know, Excel sheet where you have multiple columns and they would be tracking it there and it will be with the risk management team and they call it as a risk register. And X, uh, so that is about 1.5. 1.6 talks about appetite and tolerance defined by senior leaderships. And key stakeholder to ensure alignment with business. So you will identify what is your, uh, you know, uh, uh, risk appetite and tolerance values. Like we were discussing, right? In the earlier discussions, we talked about how what percentage of my revenue will call for for a appetite, or uh, or do you want to have a specific monetary value? Let's say like ten thousand USD or twenty thousand USD. We want to call it out that way, right? So all those you will have to understand by discussing with your senior leaders and. Uh, management collaborate in the development of risk awareness program so we talked about risk awareness programs in detail so how you do develop such risk awareness programs for the different types of teams that are there within your organization so that basically tells you the different types of the task statements that are there okay this is again the same risk management life cycle the one that is blacked out uh, because it is for your it is the current domain that we are in today so we'll talk about the characteristics of how it risk management uh, you know program has to be within your enterprise Right. Uh, we, there are a few characteristics that, that you can see uh, on the slide here. It should have a continuous improvement process. It should have the industry level good practices. When we say good practices, you have got a lot of frameworks on risk management out there. You've got NIST framework, you've got COVID frame, framework, you've got a, you know, uh, a COSO framework. You've got a lot of frameworks out there. So your risk management framework could adopt all of those industry standard practices and you can adopt them as uh, part of uh, your enterprise level risk management program right so there are a few uh, dimensions or i should say characteristics of how your uh, risk management program should be for example it should be comprehensive in in the sense that it should include all of your you know projects business lines and you know teams as part of your uh, organization right so that in that in that sense it should be comprehensive it should be complete in the sense that it should have a definite start and a stop date like uh, if you see, we have the four step, uh, you know, the process, right? So that has to be complete in that sense that uh, you cannot have an iteration running. You leave it halfway and then start up another iteration. No, so that's an incomplete risk management life cycle. So you have to, when you kick off a, a risk management exercise, it's actually, it has to be complete in a way that you see the results of the entire evaluation process. And it has to be auditable. Uh, like I said, if you remember, we talked about internal audit. We talked about three lines of defense yesterday. We talked about the business team and then the risk assessment team or the risk management team. And then there is your 
internal audit team. So when the internal audit team comes and audits the efficiency or the effectiveness of the risk management program, it has to be completely auditable in the sense that uh, you will have to showcase evidences of how you have gone through in each of those phases. Uh, for example, how was the context identified? How was the scope identified? How, how was the risk assessment plan derived? Uh, how did you do an analysis? Um, what were your parameters in terms of uh, justifying how the risks are? Uh, how did you classify them? If it's a high, medium, or a low risk. So you will see uh, an auditor, an internal auditor, when they come and ask questions around the risk management program, uh, their questions will be tightly coupled with the process on how you run your risk management program. And every phase of it will be questioned. And then they will ask questions around how do you propose controls and how do you track those controls with the business? Does the business really understand uh, what is the proposal? Do you make sure that you go back and check the uh, if the control propose proposed controls that agreed controls were actually deployed or uh, you know uh, are actually uh, implemented in the way that you would expect them to be right? And uh, how are you taking those feedbacks for you to probably take it as a next step in the next year cycle? So all that has to be very, very transparent in a way that logs or everything has to be there, right? So that makes it auditable. Justifiable, you love to say as to uh, justifiable in the sense when you say that there are a few risks which are which have accepted, there are a few risks which have treated, and there are a few risks which you have avoided, you'll have to have a justification for each of those risks. And that justification will probably uh, will, will usually come from the business uh, owners because they know best on uh, what risk can be treated and what risk cannot be treated uh, given the you know the, the dollar value that is tied to the impact versus the controls that are being proposed right so a justification has to be recorded for each of those risks and the type of uh, treatment the risk treatment that we want to uh, deploy for each of those risks so it has to be justifiable it has to be legal in the sense that you have to factor in your your IT risk management program has to be uh, legally compliant in the sense that uh, all your uh, steps that you have as part of the program is is legally binded with the requirements that you have for the organization at a holistic level and uh, the legal team and uh, is is consulted whenever there is a requirement for them to do so right and it is monitored in the sense that as you know the last phase of the risk management life cycle is the risk monitoring and control feedback phase right so in that way, you'll have to continuously monitor the uh, effectiveness of the risk management program. The, the feedback has to be captured. The KPI, KRIs, if you remember, we discussed that yesterday, right? Those have to be captured. Uh, this governance has to be in place. Th those have to be frequently discussed. Those metrics as we discussed and uh, those feedbacks have to be taken and uh, it has to be implemented. The good feedbacks or the bad feedbacks, whatever we get, has to be implemented accordingly in the next iteration of your risk management life cycle. And it has to be enforced in a way that those feedbacks that we collect are enforced and all of the you know processes procedures that we adopt uh, within the risk management team are enforced for every of the business units that is there in your organization it shouldn't be that uh, out of the 10 business teams or 10 projects that is there within your organization only a few of the teams are following it and others do not have uh, a good practice involved so it, it shouldn't be like that right so monitoring and enforcement are key you know parameters for the success of a risk management program and it has to be up to date so that is why i said the risk management life cycle is a never ending cycle it is always a cyclic process so it has to be up to date in the sense that if the company is trying to let's say acquire a new uh, entity or it's going to get, uh, get into a merger contract with a new company then obviously the risk will change the, uh, the risk appetite uh, also there's a probability that is appetite has to be revisited right and uh, you should uh, reconsider doing a risk assessment on the acquired entity or the merged entity so all those have to be updated and for example in some cases where an organization you know is trying to adopt a new technology then in those cases your risk profile changes so you'll have to uh, go ahead and then see before we even adopt that technology uh, are we uh, cognizant of what are the risks that are there for example today people are moving to cloud right as a basic example like i said earlier so you will have to be aware of what kind of data the cloud service provider can see or have access to as opposed to an on-prem infrastructure because on on-prem everything is controlled by us all the data sets that are you know accessible today will only be accessible by your own administrators which is okay but if you go to a cloud model, there are, there are certain inherent risks that you have to live with. Like, for example, if you take a software as a service model, uh, the underlying infrastructure, the databases uh, that is out there is is something you know these the the, the software vendors uh, administrators can still have access to, even though they say it is encrypted. They will have the keys of those encryption 
and they'll be able to see that data if they if they actually want to see them. So there are uh, uh, when when there is a change in the organization, your risk management uh, efforts should capture all of them, and those risks have to be added to the enterprise uh, risk register. And it has to be managed in a way that it, it should be under the purview of a risk, chief risk officer or a chief security officer, because in, in most of the organizations. Uh, you don't have a specific uh, CRO role, rather everything comes under the bucket of the chief security officer or the CISO, right? So it has to be managed in a way that uh, based on the hierarchy of the organization, it is taken care of completely and it is, uh, you have a specific uh, hierarchy on how things are managed around the enterprise, right? So those are the dimensions or the key parameters on how uh, your IT risk management uh, program should be set up, right?